Hi there, I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, it's one thing to have brilliant people in our city. It's also great to see them mentor and encourage the next generation. This is Our Vancouver. Coming up, the art of racing up mountains on skis. And what a judge on the great Canadian baking show is cooking in his kitchen. But first, what's behind the stage curtain? Okay, actors, yeah, they may get top billing, but it's stagecraft that literally creates the scene from the set painting to the prop building, stage lighting and more. Arts Umbrella is pulling back the curtain and wants kids to learn how to do it themselves. Well, with us today is Alan Brody. Alan's an instructor and the manager of Arts Umbrella's Stagecraft program. Hi there, welcome. Hi, thank you. So you've had experience right across the continent with this kind of thing. What, what are some of the sort of standout moments for you in Stagecraft? Uh, well, I was a lighting designer uh, in my practice uh, in the theater for uh, three decades. Uh, the overcoat, was a significant um, production in my history that took me from Vancouver in the early days, clear across, across the country a few times, and it played international festivals and played in the States. And so that was certainly um, a credit that, uh, you know, took me around quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I bet going to a play with you is a totally different experience. You would be looking at it's, completely different things than I, I would be watching the actor yeah. who's in front, who's in the spotlight. It's the worst. Okay. It's the worst because <laughs> it's, it's hard to detach from the thing that you know the best, which for me was lighting. And so um, I think the experience of somebody sitting beside me what, could be pretty frustrating <laughs> because I was clocking things that the average person might not see at all. Right. And being in my own openings when things go wrong, the absolute worst. Right. I've bolted from my seat more than once right. to the booth to try to right. find no, out what's going on. That's exactly. Not what I exactly. It's supposed to be over here. Yeah. So okay, lighting, the set design, all of that kind of thing. What, what attracted you to this in the first place? Uh, I was really fortunate. I grew up in northern BC in a small town, and we happened to have the opportunity to take stagecraft in grade eleven. And I had some friends who had done it before, and they got to then work in the, the local theater, the community theater. And um, I realized right away the stagecraft was this amazing blend of a technical discipline or technical disciplines and creative disciplines. And so that worked really well for my brain. You know, I was an artsy kid, but I also loved like doing things with my hands and understanding how things worked. So it was the perfect blend. And that has not changed. It's that's exactly the nature of stagecraft. Right, but what has changed since since you well, studied stagecraft at UBC? Yeah. Was it eighty-five to eighty-nine? Eighty-five so to eighty-nine. We've come a long way, yeah. maybe. <laughs> so we we have. You know, I learned hand drafting and watercolor rendering. Um, computers were just starting to make their way into the industry in terms of um, lighting databases and lighting control, and. Now it's all digital, all computer controlled. Students are learning computer, computer aided drafting. Um, they're using computer tools for um, creating renderings. You know, we make we make models of sets, but we make them in a computerized environment now. We don't necessarily have to build a physical 3D model. Right. A lot has changed uh, on that side, but in terms of the fundamentals and understanding how stagecraft. Um, informs uh, the dramaturgy, the storytelling, that hasn't changed. And that's really what's at the heart of our program at Arts Umbrella. Well, how do you teach kids that? I mean, especially that you're teaching kids as young as six years old that's when they're right. coming up for, for yeah. spring break. Yeah. Um, what, what, how, how, do you, how do you explain well, that? This is as important yeah. or more important than, than the actual play we're putting on right now. Yeah, so um, we're not putting power tools in the six-year-old's hands, you know, <laughs> thankfully. thankfully. Everybody kind of wonders if that's what we're doing. Um, it's about um, starting to develop an understanding of storytelling, but through a, from a different perspective, through a different lens, you know. So how can the physical environment uh, that we place a set or place a, sorry, that we place a production inside of, mm -hmm. how does that support the storytelling? 
And um, it's quite amazing to see kids start to engage in the idea of um, how does the environment um, support the play. It leads to conversations around character and costume. And um, it's really, you know, it's really deeply tied to an understanding of what is the story that we're telling here. Right. Yeah. So if you're teaching these kids and they do have that, that moment of, hey, this is for me, in the yeah. same way that, yeah. that lighting attracted yeah. you way back then, what, what kinds of opportunities are there out, out there for them in the future? Well, uh, you know, there's work in the theater is, is yep. the big one, yep. but um, work in film or television production as well. You know, we've, we ask the question a lot at Arts Umbrella, what is stagecraft? And um, it's, if you name um, a, a, a craft or a creative discipline, it probably has a, a place in stagecraft and backstage. And I would say anybody who is training in theater production or stagecraft, um, those skills are all transferable to special events, um, film, television. Um, it's sort of the gateway to a lot of other disciplines. Um, but there's something about starting in theater that feels quite uh, like that feels the right like the right place to start like that yeah. alan thank you for coming in and My thanks pleasure. for shining a light <laughs> on stagecraft and and no all of the opportunities therein have thank a you. great spring break and beyond thank you so much this is all vancouver <laughs> All right, it's time for one of our favorite features. This is where we get to showcase some of the photographs that you send in. We'll start with this one from Bikram Rijal. He captured this moment. Just look way in the distance there. See his nine-year-old daughter, Ahana's arms outstretched. That's at the Barnett Marine Park in Burnaby. Looks like she's having fun there. I love that silhouette. And Cheryl Smith snapped this shot of the iconic engagement sculpture on Sunset Beach. Just the right time there. Simply gorgeous, Cheryl, thank you. And finally, Carolina Arias took this photograph in Seal Cove, looking over the seaplane base in Prince Rupert. That is just gorgeous, Carolina. Prince Rupert, one of my very favorite places. It's my hometown. Send in more photographs. Just send them by email to bcphotos at cbc.ca. bcphotos at cbc.ca. Now, the Burgess Shale is thought to hold the secret to not just humanity, but to the Earth itself, and it's in our own backyard. The CBC joined a paleontologist as he led an expedition there last summer in search of marine fossils dating back more than 500 million years. We are here uh, at the quarry site. Very, very special place where we are excavating fossils uh, of uh, Cambrian age, which are about 500 million years. And uh, we're excavating layer by layer. I'm Jean-Bernard Caron. I'm a, a curator of uh, invertebrate paleontology at the Royal Ontario Museum. These uh, layers basically record uh, episodes of uh, mass mortality event, of uh, uh, communities of animals that live at the bottom of the ocean at the time. Wow, look at this. Oh. Beautiful. Wow. And they were buried very quickly, dramatically, and catastrophically. So uh, all the organs that the, these animals uh, contain are still preserved uh, in, in stunning quality. Today we found actually a specimen which shows beautifully uh, the eyes and the, the, the brain of that organism. The Canadian Rockies are a magical place, and the Burgess Shale is uh, legendary. Did you check in here? My name is Robert Gaines. I'm a professor of geology at Pomona College in Claremont, California. You might find it unusual that seabeds are comprising the mountains here, but uh, that's the action of much later mountain building. Uh, so uh, although these rocks were, are some half a billion years old, or 500 million years old, the, uh, the age of the uplift of the, of the Rockies is, uh, goes back to only about 100 million years old. 
the sea that covered uh, all of North America was into Saskatchewan, certainly by this time that the Burgess Shale was deposited. In most places, it was only a few meters to a few tens of meters deep, a very shallow ocean. Uh, but here in the Burgess Shale, we have an area where we're approaching the edge of North America at the time, and we have a, a drop off into a basin, which was really key to uh, the animals, their habitat, and also their preservation. There's probably like at least 15 different species of organisms preserved at the same time. Many fossils here occur along the same layer, which uh, record a single event of burial of all these animals. And it's interesting, we find pairs of these species together certainly um, add a, a social behavior and certainly, uh, you know, present, re this represents an important record of ecology. And this site yields far better preserved specimens, far more specimens. And so we're going to be able to revisit our interpretation of this early fish, which really connects all of us, uh, the vertebrates with the mammals, the reptiles, the amphibians. They all bring, uh, come down to this particular fish at some point in their evolution. We do explorations routinely to find out where the Burgess Shale is well exposed. Ooh! Attends, la lumière, wow! Sometimes it's very easy uh, when we're walking across these slopes to find fossils spread across the hills in, in the rocks. Uh, and then it's my job as the geologist to track those back up higher into the mountain face and determine precisely the layers where they're coming. Joe, is he coming? Yeah. There's not a lot of days, even at the Burgess Shale, where we can make the kind of discoveries that we made today. My name is Joe Moisiek and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto and the Royal Ontario Museum. This has the, the marking here, so there should be right, right. One of the things that I was most excited about was this discovery of a complete specimen of an animal called Cambro raster, which was actually the first species that I got to name. Uh, and it's very rare to find these things complete. We only have a couple of examples uh, previously found, and this one is just remarkable looking. We call it Cambro raster falcatus, which means the uh, the, the first part of the name means the Cambrian rake, which is in reference to the frontal claws on this animal, which look like rakes, and we think it would have used them to probe through the sediment in search of buried food. And then the second part of the name, falcatus, refers to the fact that this thing has this really unique looking head shield that looks a lot like the Millennium Falcon spaceship. So we gave a little nod to that. There's something going into the wall. I was always one of these bug kids that was pulling up rocks. And so fortunately at the Royal Ontario Museum, they have this um, periodic fossil identification clinic. And so I brought in some of these things that I was finding. I was probably about seven or eight at the time. And then over the years, I just got more and more into the fossils. I'm in the last year of my PhD right now. So I will be moving on somewhere for a postdoc and later, hopefully some kind of a job in academia. I find very important to train the new generation of scientists and paleontologists in this case. Oh, it's probably a, an interruptness worm. Yeah. Oh! Yeah, Turbank. Should probably keep this. And I think it's very uh, important to realize that there's still a lot of research areas to, uh, to explore, and uh, one person cannot do everything. Couper ça. I'm super thankful to Jean Bernard for all of the opportunities that he's given me in the field to, to make these discoveries in the first place and then also to work on the material that we found as well as some of the older collections at the ROM. Science is a, a field that is constantly trying to improve on itself and so part of the legacy that you leave as a researcher is your students. You want to fill that part off? Yeah, go for it. Our field is pretty small and it is essential, I think, that we have as many different viewpoints as possible. And there's so many different fossils to be worked on here. It's not like uh, Jean Bernard could do all of the descriptions of the fossils all by himself. And as he trains new students and new researchers, they come with their own points of view. They are taking classes in biology that are more up to date. Uh, they have a good understanding of the groups they're working on. And they find, they see new features. They ask different questions. Everyone's perspective is different. And sometimes that's really important in opening new doorways. The next generation is really prepared to answer different questions and new kinds of questions. Coming up, are the terms cold-blooded and warm-blooded passe? 
Johanna Wagstaff is going to be here. She'll update us on the new lingo to differentiate reptiles and humans. Reptile cold-blooded, humans warm-blooded. Most of us are pretty good at figuring out which category animals belong to when it comes to the way they heat their bodies. But it turns out those terms are inaccurate, implying that animals are in a never-ending struggle to stay warm or cold. So start rolling endothermic versus ectothermic off the tongue. Ectothermic animals, like reptiles and amphibians, rely on the external environment to regulate their body temperatures. If it's too hot, these animals seek cooler places, and if it's too cold, they may find a sunny spot to warm up. They can also slow down their metabolisms, reducing their need to seek food until environmental conditions improve. Endotherms, like mammals, birds, and yes, humans, regulate body temperatures by producing heat within the body. But that takes a lot of energy, aka food. And that means they have to slog through rougher conditions like extreme heat because they can't power down the furnace or AC unit. Now, before we learn that we'll all be living under reptile overlords someday, know that the animal kingdom has already taken a big hit from climate change as a whole. When facing a warmer world, animals basically respond in one of three ways. Some adapt their behaviors, others undergo rapid evolution and pass down beneficial traits, and still others straight up die out. Many scientists believe we are living through a sixth extinction, but it's hard to count animals. In 2022, the World Wildlife Fund attempted an animal census. It concluded Earth's wildlife populations have plunged by an average of 69% in just under 50 years. But that decline is attributed to not just climate change, but also loss of habitat and to pollution. And that means we need more research to understand how we're impacting the environment and in turn, the beings that live in it. And now you're science smart. If you have a science question, send me an email and I'll try to get it answered. Johanna, thank you so much. You are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, you may know him as a judge on the Great Canadian Baking Show, but you can also see him live at the BC Home and Garden Show. He's going to be presenting on the cooking stage. Here's the big reveal right now. Yeah, you're going to remember when Bruno Feldison as well was pastry chef instructor at the Pacific Institute of Culinary Arts here in Vancouver. He's had so much experience, but we definitely recognize you from the baking show. Welcome to our Vancouver. Thank you, Gloria, for having me here. Well, I know you are going to be a big draw for, for the BC Home and Garden Show mm -hmm. as well. Just set it up for us. And we're, we're going to dive in here to a, mm -hmm. a cool dessert in a moment. But what, what can people expect on, on the big stage? So, um, about 40 minutes cooking demonstration live, a lot of question and answer. And uh, one of the recipes I will make, it's uh, cannolis mm. with uh, mascarpone and espresso cream inside. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. So is that a dessert or is that a main? Uh, it's a dessert. It's Finger, a dessert. Finger dessert. Are, you, are yeah. you all about the desserts all the time? No, no, I do a lot of cooking as well. So, you do that? Yeah, yeah. Different approach, different feeling, different emotions, but I enjoy doing from bread, to butchering, to cooking, to harvesting, actually. Well, harvesting sure. Up. Well, okay. Let, let's go down that emotional path then, shall we? Because with the with the with great Canadian cooking show, there's or baking show, there's a lot of emotion there, isn't there? So you're a judge. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you draw on your own experience? You know the pressures, producing under pressure as you're in that position. It, it, it's difficult, you know. Um, you know, it's always uh, the biggest challenge is the timing. And if you can control the, your time, then you should be okay, you know. And I always encourage people to practice, 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 because it's the best way to understand the whole process. Okay. Okay. And then for me, the hardest part is really to digest all those cakes and desserts and right. pastries. <laughs> How do you do that? Um, I do well. I do, yeah, yeah. I do very well. No, I, do I mean, do you counter that with some, you know, here on the West Coast, some sort of outdoor activity, that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, you know, the whole process, it's about seven weeks of, uh, for the show when we film it. So, you know, I prepare myself before with a lot of exercise. Right now I'm doing a lot of skiing on a local hill. That's good for you. And then uh, when we are done, then it's summertime, so I can go on my bicycle or do a lot of hiking as well. 
Right. You know, you've, you've become quite a spokesperson for, for mental health issues mm -hmm. as well, Bruno, over the years, for people in the industry and not in the industry. But let, let's just use, you know, baking as, as some sort of a solace or escape. And where does that fit into, you know, helping out with, with mental health? <clears throat> I think baking, it's about celebrating and giving. You know, we don't bake because we are starving. Usually we do some bake at home to celebrate a birthday or to bring up in your office or with friends, you know. So there is a celebration part that's very nurturing, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, people forget food, it's about sharing. So, you know, baking is a good focus to really help yourself to, um, I, take, I use it as a feel good moment. You know, and it does create great memories as well. Well, okay, but you, this is all the positive. This is when everything works out. What uh -huh. if you have, you know, maybe a dessert that didn't turn <clears throat> out the way you planned? Then spin it, you know. I mean, you know, if your baguette is not straight, then you don't call it a baguette. You call it an Italian rustic <laughs> bread. <laughs> That's a good so there word. is a way, you know, if it's too soft, then you don't call it a mousse, you call it a, a custard. You know, there is a way, you know, the story behind any Food, it's very important. Yeah, and mm -hmm. at the end of the day, even if it doesn't look perfect, it probably tastes pretty great yeah. because it's got all the ingredients mm -hmm. here. What have you brought in today? What are you going to take us so through? So today we're doing a very simple dessert. It's a buttermilk panna cotta oh. with a mango marmalade. I love, I love using mango in winter. Mm. And on the top we do a, a normal chocolate chip cookie crumble. Where do we start? So we start a very simple process. We mix together in a bowl brown sugar, flour, almond flour, some uh, wonderful cocoa powder I brought from France, some butter, okay, okay. all mixed by hands, put on the tray, okay. bake. You've pre-measured everything. Let's pretend this yeah. would all go in here, but and I know it takes a while to, to get the, mm -hmm. the butter all in, but that's great. That's all, that's all it takes? Yeah, okay. yeah. You know, a few mixing with your hands, right. put it on the tray, goes in the oven, okay. and then at the end, we get this beautiful cookie crumble. You know, it's crunchy. Uh, oh, I see. Oh, I yeah. thought that was like a dark a demerara sugar or something like that. It hardened. Yeah. Got a piece of that? That's a cookie. Sure. So this gets, this is not a crust? This is this no, gets mixed gonna, into the actual? Yeah, that's going to go, I'll show mm. you when we're going to build it. Mm, okay. I could just take a bowl of those, frankly. Okay, so that's uh, all together. <coughs> pretend, yeah. pretend, pretend. We've mixed all this up. We've, we've got the butter all in and this hot chocolate. Like and that. then we, the buttermilk panna cotta itself, mm -hmm. it's a mix of it's half cream, half buttermilk, a little gelatin powder, I put a little honey for sweetness. Mm. Bring, you warm it, put it in a glass, chill it a few hours, then you get your panna cotta. Look at that, I love the texture I of a panna cotta after a meal. Even though you're talking about butter and buttermilk, or you know, mm -hmm. milk and buttermilk cream, yeah. it still tastes light. I pretend it's light. It, it is light, yeah. but it has this beautiful creamy texture. Yes. Yes. I love using buttermilk because it cut into the richness of just a cream panna cotta. Mm -hmm. It gives it a little bit of a... Yeah, a little, a little tang. A little tang yeah. like that. And, um, you know, you could serve it that way. It's very tasty. It's very no, good. Oh, come on. You brought in all this. I Let's do, dress it up. Let's dress it up. I mix a cooked sugar and uh, mango, fresh or frozen. Oh. It's either way. And then when it's cooked, you have uh, this chunky marmalade. How long does that take? About 10 minutes. So, 10 minutes. Yeah. Sugar and marmalade. Equal, sort of equal parts kind of thing? or Approximately. Or, or sugar and mango. Okay. Then I spoon it into the glass. So, you know, that's a two-step process. And already you got a beautiful, colorful, you know, you want to see a, a nice contrast. I love that. And contrast visual, but also in texture. Mm -hmm. Creamy panna cotta, chunky marmalade-like mango jam. And of course, to make it nicer and better, we can top it with some... I've already cheated on that one, haven't chocolate I? Chocolate cookie crumble. <laughs> and again, you know, that's what we're looking for. Is the visual, gorgeous? The visual is very important. I have a feeling there's more visual coming because you've got a couple of mandarins here as well. There's so you layer Look at that. Look consistent at that. in a volume. Yep. We're going to get a little soft there. We're going to get a little crunch there and then the cream at the bottom. Perfect. And with all of those textures. And that makes usually a very good dessert. When you have these different components, mm -hmm. you know, the visual excites you when you see it. Mm -hmm. Then when you dig into it, you know, the whole texture in your mouth makes it like a very okay. unique dessert. And of course, to finish it, a little aroma right. or scent. I take a tangerine. They are great well, seasons. Tangerine. I said mandarin. Tangerine. Tangerine okay. or mandarin. Yes. Pretty much okay. the same. A macroplane. Yes. And then... Uh, you're great, some little zest mm. on the top. That's going to hit your tongue and and you can smell it. Very yes, it is gorgeous. I can smell it all this way. Oh look at now the fun part. And this is a fun part. 
Let's see. Let's dig in. All through the, all of those flavors, you're going to get all of that going on. And that mm. makes a perfect breakfast. Mm. <laughs> breakfast! It does. Lunch, you know, dinner, I'm taking it. Three courses. Bruno, if I was a judge, 10 out of 10. Thank 10 you. out of 10, Thank you're you. a winner. Am I making it to the next round? <laughs> you are making yeah. it to the next round. Thank you for coming in. You're very good. Thank you for having me. You've got one too. This is so beautiful. Mm. Keep trying to cover my eyes. Oh. Yeah. Is it my bad today? Hey, if you'd like to get out and see some live music, Toronto's Division plays the Orpheum Tuesday, March 21st. I was walking home when I heard you were found. Was a phone call that came in and it turned me right around. Then you can catch Victoria's current swell at the Commodore, Saturday, March 25th. Hi, I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music. And while social media sharing site TikTok may be under heavy scrutiny from our federal government, it remains an extremely powerful and very real tool for musicians. Case in point, Leith Ross. Leith is originally from Manatick, Ontario, same hometown as trivia fans, rock band Colorado. Leith Ross really blew up in the last couple of years and was signed to Republic Records on the strength of this song. It was simple, you are sweetness. Let's just sit a while. Deep me, turn a little, and I'll feel the sickness less and less. Come and kiss me. That's Leith Ross's breakout TikTok hit called We'll Never Have Sex. That's a genre that's been dubbed everything from sad folk to bedroom pop, whatever the label, it's very clear that Leith Ross has not only found an audience, but a community building a safe space where people from around the world are connecting with Leith's music in deep and meaningful ways. You never love the same amount. You spent a week at my mother's house And honest, I can tell you now I love you more than my future spouse And if you come to me When I've promised to commit If you told me that you loved me And asked me for a kiss Well, I'd at least have to think about it that's Leith Ross with a beautiful tune called, I'd Have to Think About It. Now I mentioned that Leith is from the small Ontario town of Manatick. So the usual progression for artists on the rise is to move to Montreal or Toronto or New York. But Leith Ross did things a little differently, instead moving to Winnipeg. Why? Well, the flourishing music community there has welcomed Leith, a non-binary musician, with open arms. Artists like Joey Landreth, Begonia, and Boy Golden, to name a few. Leith Ross has also attracted the attention of other established singers from other parts of Canada as well. Check it out. So months ago, my friend Tyler from Southern Wales says, you gotta check out Leith Ross on TikTok. And I was brand new to the app. I didn't know much about TikTok, but I go and I just blown away. This person's uh, songwriting is so mature and their voice is completely incredible. And I said, I gotta DM this person. And I was thinking, you know, they're from Canada. I'm from Canada. It's conceivable that they have heard my music. Was not expecting this response. This really blew me away. Made me so happy that they were familiar with my songs. Um, and I suggested, hey, we should write a song together sometime. And so we did. Yes, that's two-time Juno winner Dan Mangan sharing his love for Leith Ross, and that song they wrote together has yet to be released. In the meantime, Leith Ross is about to embark on their first ever North American and European tour, and it's almost completely sold out, and Leith hasn't even left Winnipeg. London, England, Dublin, Ireland, sold out. Los Angeles, Atlanta, Toronto, Vancouver, all sold out. This is incredible for a debut tour. I want to sit around and watch you do your hair, talk it all into the ground, have a ceremony there for something, don't know what it'd be, but it become nothing, it's nothing, and you'd smile at me. Chicken. 
That's Winnipeg singer-songwriter Phenom Leith Ross with their great new single, You On My Arm, which is currently climbing the CBC Music Top 20 right now. And You On My Arm by Leith Ross is a song that you need to add to your pop playlist for this week. I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music. I'll check in with you again soon. And coming up, the art of ski mole or uphill skiing. Hi, thanks for joining us for Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, ski mountaineering, a.k.a. ski mole, is coming back to the Winter Olympics for the first time since 1946. So instead of using a chairlift, ski mole athletes use skins on the bottom of their skis to grip their way up the slopes and then ski back down. Just check out this documentary made for CBC Sports. You can almost meditate once you're out there, once you get into the rhythm of climbing the mountain. It can't compare to taking a chairlift up the mountain. It's a different kind of feeling. Ski mountaineering and ski mountaineering racing is still a very young sport in Canada. We're a very welcoming community. We come from different sport backgrounds. We're runners, we're bikers, we're skaters, we're biathletes and we all come together for the love of the sport. This is our story. Ski mo is different from just conventional downhill lift skiing because we ascend the mountain or go up the mountain with skins on our feet to propel us up. So skins are basically like sticky carpets that give you traction only on the up, they don't allow you to slide down. So it's amazing, we can climb 40, 50 degree slopes without sliding back at all. So that would be really what differentiates it is we're self-propelled up as opposed to a chairlift. A lot of the time we're, we're pushing near max on the uphill, so our anaerobic threshold is just redlined. Some of the best athletes in our sport have some of the highest VO2 maxes in the world. My name's Kylie Toth and I'm on the Canadian Ski Mountaineering National Team. I got into ski mountaineer racing. I was a competitive speed skater actually. From the age of five to 23, I competed internationally on the national team. When I retired, I realized I really loved training and I loved the freedom of the mountains instead of being confined by an ice rink. It wasn't necessarily love at first sight. It was very hard and I didn't complete my first race, but I think like many people, the challenge captivated them. race for myself. If it's not bringing me joy, I see no reason to push myself that hard. Your competitors will always change. There will always be somebody better than you, so you can't really focus on that. All you can do is just focus on yourself. My name's Emma. I am a ski mountaineer athlete. I am also a biathlete and I actually started schema racing thanks to my coach from biathlon. I'm 19 years old and I've been the youngest girl at basically every race I've done. I really hope that more girls join the sport of ski mountaineering. It's a sport mainly dominated by men and I hope that some girls decide to start kicking butt because we can do it too. It's, it's scary, but we can do it.
I think you have to be pretty strong mentally to practice ski mountaineering. If you decide to stop, there's no, there's no coasting in it. Going up the hill is very tough. Your legs are screaming for you to stop. Your lungs are gasping for more air. Your heart is pounding. So you push off from the top. You feel the wind on your face. And then you feel your skis slicing through the snow. And your skis go wherever you want them to go. So my name is Peter Knights. I'm a ski mountaineering athlete. I got started because I used to race mountain bikes and wanted something to do in the winter. I've been doing this for over 10 years now. I was actually diagnosed with testicular cancer last year. When you're sitting in the chair for a couple hours getting the IV infusion, all you can really think about is just getting out there again. Ski mountaineering was something that kept me going through the treatments. I left my skis in my living room just so I could see them every once in a while. This year I've been getting back into ski mountaineering and trying to work back up. I keep looking at my times and my performances from before and I'm trying to, to hit those as well and hopefully surpass them in the future. This sport can be trained for entirely inbounds out of avalanche danger. We just need more access to ski hills. A lot of ski hills don't allow us to walk uphill in order for the sport to grow. In the future, I hope that access will be better and we'll see more youngsters out there. I think you should cheer on Team Canada Olympics for ski mountaineering because we are an underdog in this sport. The sport doesn't have a lot of history here compared to Western Europe. What's more Canadian than being out in the outdoors in the snow in the winter? This sport has a lot of opportunity for more Canadians to join. Coming up, how a professional skier uses a technique called ninja sticking to climb big mountains with one leg. Hi there, I'm Gloria Makarenko, and you are watching Our Vancouver. Now, The Approach, it's an action-driven ski and snowboard film that aims to elevate people of color, women, and adaptive athletes. Vasu Sojitra is one of those featured skiers, and I had a chance to speak to him when he was in town for the Vancouver International Mountain Film Festival. Oh, hello there, and welcome to Vancouver, and welcome to the studio. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Nice to have you here in person, too. So let's talk about this conversation that you're going to be leading at the festival, discussing your own, your own approach and, I guess, your own philosophy um, to the outdoors. Can you share that with us? Yeah, so a lot of what I uh, fight for and stand for is trying to showcase that outdoors is a human right, and uh, as humans, we have evolved with our natural landscapes. And through that, I just utilize skiing as one of the conduits to be able to showcase that um, with a bunch of my friends and try to show that with one of the films that we're showing as well within the snow show called The Approach. So yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the major ways that I try to really showcase uh, the joy that our community can showcase. Oh, show. I, okay, mm -hmm. I, I hear that. What, what does that look like? Um, so a lot of that looks like trying to provide access for others that might not look like the status quo within the snow sports world. Um, you know, there's not a lot of people that look like me, um, disabled or a person of color, to be able to um, experience some of these bigger mountains that I get the, I get the chance of experiencing. So um, breaking down some of that, um, showcasing that, you know, um, it doesn't really make a big difference um, what gear or how you look or um, how you say certain things, but it's mostly just the experience and the joy and the um, 
mostly the feeling that we get from these sports that really connect us to our the natural landscape. Sure. And and I know a lot of your story sort of includes the influence of growing up in India. So how does your, your childhood, I guess, continue to, to shape your philosophy and, and your career today? Yeah. So a lot of it um, is based in kind of the Eastern influence. Um, I was born in the States, but lived in Connecticut uh, for just a little bit before moving to India for almost five or so years. My parents are immigrants to the States and um, kind of just embodying that ideology from the East and showcasing that interdependency and community aspect as much as possible when it comes through any of these activities. So, okay. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. Now, another term that comes to light when we look at your work, your, your personal motto of ninja sticking. What, what, what's ninja sticking? <laughs> um, so this was coined when I was climbing the Grand Teton years and years ago with another friend, and he was watching me put my crutches on really precarious places and watching... Uh, me being agile with my crutches, and he coined ninja sticking me down the mountain. And based off that, I've kind of pulled that into my philosophy. And it's more of this like mindset around bringing levity to such a heavy topic like disability or medical equipment. And then also it's just fun and playful and um, gets people kind of excited about what I do as well. Yeah, well, and you, what you do, you sometimes you take it to the extreme, don't you? I mean, you're you're the first disabled athlete to ski off with this Denali mm-hmm. via the the West Buttress and the Fuhrer Finger off of Tacoma. That's Mount, Mount Rainier. Just Correct. Take us through that. Yeah, so myself and Pete McAfee, another adaptive athlete who also has one leg, uh, we were the first people to with a disability to ski off of Denali, which was fairly monumental, I'd say. Um, and a lot of it goes into like this idea of first only different, where like the biggest thing is showcasing that disabled people can do this, especially when provided access to certain resources. I first, I personally feel very, very privileged to be where I'm at right now. And be able to access, you know, the mountains, access the equipment, be able to navigate a lot of these spaces. So Denali was definitely one of those major accomplishments. Well, sure. How do you even work up to that kind of an extreme event? Right. I mean, I've been skiing for 20 years, ski touring for 10, um, mountaineering for pretty much that time too. So just trying to kind of level up every year, doing something a bit more scary, a bit more extreme, um, but all in my wheelhouse and not trying to fully scare myself too much. Okay. Are, are there are there more peaks that, oh, that you want to tackle? Much so. Yeah. Yes, well, yes. What's on your list? Um, ideally, I'd love to try to ski up all seven summits. Um, and just again, to showcase that what access can provide. Now, at the end of this program, we like to tip our hats to our talented photojournalists on staff here at CBC Vancouver. They bring us images in their artful ways to give depth and character to the stories that we cover. So here's a sampling from what they saw this past week. And that's all for our Vancouver for this week. I hope you can join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio 1 for On the Coast. For now, bye-bye.